with me, uh, myself, Councilman Curtis Jones and Councilman Greenlee. I first want to thank you all for coming out uh, to this very important hearing. This is a continuation of the first hearing where we had uh, the mayor's office testify March 18th where uh, they were uh, presenting their anti-violence reduction strategy by Ms. Garrett Harley, who is the managing director for public safety. Today's floor will be given to our community activists who provide to provide public com comment <laughs> on the mayor's plan. There are we view you as our boots on the ground. We view you as the front line, uh, and want to get your insights and comments on that violence reduction plan. Uh, I want to welcome you uh, and thank you for what you have done and what, God willing, you will do in the future. I also have Councilman Green, would you like to say anything? Thank you. If not, um, we are going to begin the hearing. Uh, Ms. Williams, would you please uh, announce the first panel to testify? Uh, the first panel to testify, and just know that we're going a little bit out of order from your witness list, oh. um, would be Bilal Quayum, uh, Mike OG Law, Tabab, and Stanley Crawford. Thank you. Please uh, approach the witness table. Um, always say your name uh, for the record. Um, we are not going to put a limit on testimony if we are within like eight to ten minutes. That'll be great. Um, but thank you. State your name. Please begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Councilman um, Jones and um, Councilman um, Greenlee. Uh, my name is Bilal Kayyum. I'm president of the Father's Day Rally Committee. I'm glad, the Councilman, you said that there was no time limit so I could give my Fidel Castro speech. Um, but in all seriousness, um, I would like to start off by saying that um, the day um, I was, when I was driving here, I was thinking about uh, one of my heroes, Fannie Lou Hamer, who had a saying and saying, I'm sick of tired of being sick of tired. And I think everybody in this audience and in this council today probably feel that way, the way I do. My testimony is going to be more about recommendations. We all know the problems. We all know that 95% um, of all shootings in the city of Philadelphia are black and Latino. Um, and we can talk about the numbers, but that's not going to solve that. So I want to get right into uh, my recommendations um, regarding the plan that the mayor and, 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 and the staff, their staff um, <coughs> produce, and also some other things I think can be done to help resolve the violence problem in the city of Philadelphia. First of all, in the plan, it's a part that talks about the economic impact of violence in the city of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I've been talking about this, as you probably know, for years. Um, and it was a national study done on, of 10 cities, and Philadelphia was one of those cities to show that if we cut violence around 10%, we could save roughly probably 17 to 20, 25 million. If we cut it by 25%, we could save 65, up to 100 or, or plus million dollars. Um, that was a national study done. Um, and I think that since it's in the plan, that council, now this might sound strange for folks, but because you know I'm not about big about studying stuff, but I think that council should consider doing a study on what the real economic impact in the city is today. Um, I did have a conversation with the controller about this issue a couple months ago, and she was willing to look at doing a study, an updated study on the study that was done before. Because I think it's going to be very important that the more data we have, the more information that's accurate uh, about what is the real economic impact of violence in the city of Philadelphia. I think it would be important um, to this administration and, and the city council. So that's my first recommendation. Second is that I think it needs to be more discussion with the city administration around the messaging uh, of the violence campaign in the city of Philadelphia. I did talk to um, Deputy um, Manning's director. I get your title right? Um, Harley before <laughs> about this. Um, I know that the health department had a, put money out around two years ago, and they had a campaign where they, it was shoot 
Now what? Um, and I know they want to, the city is looking at renewing on doing that um, messaging again. Uh, a lot of folks I talk to is not necessarily think that's the best messaging we should be sending out. So I just think it needs to be more dialogue about what the messaging will be. Um, the, the deputy manager director said that will happen. So um, uh, I think that that's one of the recommendations. Third recommendation about the plan, if you look at the budget that was submitted when uh, the city folks testified, there's $6.3 million in the budget for the um, Department of License and Expression. Um, I really believe under the violence prevention five-year plan, I really believe that council and administration should really look at that money should be in the regular Department of License and Inspection's budget. Anyhow, I don't support or agree that it should be in the violence prevention. Now, I know it's, you know, it's, Arguments on both sides about cleaning up lots, greening neighborhoods will help reduce violence. There's been studies about that. Um, but I just think that I'm not opposed with cleaning or, or, or tearing down properties. As a matter of fact, I'm a strong supporter of that. I just think that that, that money should be allocated in the regular budget or l and I, and I don't know, understand why they didn't ask for that, but that's another discussion. The fourth um, recommendation I have is that in the city of Baltimore um, last year, they had a ballot question that was introduced by um, city council members in Baltimore where they created what they called the Baltimore Youth, Child, and Children's Fund. Um, and it was a ballot question put on uh, the ballot in Baltimore for the citizens to vote for it. And 80% of, of the citizens in Baltimore voted favorably. So they created this Baltimore Youth, Children Fund of $10 million per year. So it's a fund that continues on. It's just not a one year um, initiative. It's every year for 10 years. That money goes to community-based organizations and groups working with children and youth in the city of Baltimore. I, I know that I share this with um, you and Councilman Kanada and Councilman Clark and also Councilman Green and Councilman um, um, Sanchez, and I noticed Councilman Sanchez has said that she's having her staff to kind of look at it. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for the city. What they did in Baltimore, and I don't know the exact percentages, but they, the ballot question allowed for the residents to decide that some of the money that is collected for property tax would go in this fund. But it was a small percentage, so it wasn't affecting any kind of initial programs that are using property tax dollars for. I would love to see city council do that. You, my understanding is you probably have enough time to consider to do that um, before you adjourn for the summer. And it could be a ballot question in the November election. Let the citizens of the city of Philadelphia decide if it should happen like they did in Baltimore. How much did Baltimore? It's $10 million per year. And they have actually started giving out grants to organizations in Baltimore. And if you look at the list, and I could give you the information, um, in Baltimore, some of the grants up to two, three hundred thousand dollars So they're not small grants. And, it's, and in all fairness, it kind of looks like what the city's doing now with the grant program, targeted grant program they have out to 500000 what groups can apply for now in the city, running the Food Urban Affairs Coalition. So similar, but it's much more money Ten million is a big difference in five million. Um, we understand three or four sides the city of Baltimore. So, if Baltimore can figure out how to spend ten million dollars, I don't understand why the city of Philadelphia can't come up with ten million or more annually going to this fund um, to support community-based organizations. The fifth is um, something that's an old issue that has been talked a lot about. Um, Sultan Ahmed. Had, I know came up with this idea about a social bond proposal where we will float a bond, same way we float bonds for infrastructure in the city of Philadelphia, but you'll float a bond for community, I mean, going to groups working in the city, community-based organizations, community development corporations. Sutan's proposal is actually asking for a $600 million um, proposal bond to float a bond. Um, and I have that information I could share with you and all the council members about what that concept looks like. Um, the, my sixth recommendation is the city of Philadelphia and, and the city council 
seriously needs to look at creating a job initiative um, using dollars that I'm not sure where it would come from, to be honest with you. You know, it's, it could be debated back and forth about surplus dollars, but we really need a job initiative. Um, and a job slash, I'm saying training, because a lot, of job, a lot of young men that we need to target to help to get them to get off the streets and get them work are not prepared. We got to be honest about that. So we got to prepare them, but we need to look at how we could create a job program. Example is school districts has announcement to clean up these schools, lead and other issues. I'm hearing any figures from $5 billion to $7 billion. So we're talking about thousands of jobs. I think for every billion dollars, if you use a formula like $40 per job or something like that, it's, it's for a billion dollars, you can create over 1,000 jobs, 1,000, 1,500 jobs. Can you imagine having 5,000 jobs in the city of Philadelphia created now that can help target it to neighborhoods where all the violence are going on to create employment opportunities? So I, that's it. And my seventh recommendation, um, which is uh, my last recommendation, but is something that um, is constantly debated. Council has to take some bold moves. Council cannot sit around now uh, and let business be as usual. When developers come into the city of Philadelphia and they're doing projects, they're getting tax breaks, they're getting um, tips and all that, we have to make sure that they, in fact, are committed to minority participation and also work which means that um, we have to have a draw the line in the sand kind of position, as far as I'm concerned, with the unions. If they're not hiring uh, minorities, when I'm talking about minorities, particularly black and, and Latino, I'm not talking about women. Um, I'm talking about men and women, but not so much you know, the, the WB um, standards that you see constantly. If they're not doing that, then their project should be stopped or upfront being very clear to those developers <coughs> that they will not receive any assistance in the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in the future. I just think that we're at the point now, if we're really going to be serious about resolving and solving problems of violence in the city of Philadelphia, we have to be serious about it. We can't no longer sit around and talk about it. We got to put, like Chip O'Neill once said, former congressman, once said, you can always tell how serious elected official is by looking at the budgets. If there's no budget amount that is really helpful to resolve the problem, then it's not serious. And I think, once again, everybody in this city wants to resolve this problem about shootings and homicides. Now, I know that I looked on the television all night. Um, when you get old, you can't always sleep right. So in the middle of the night, sometimes I wake up and I go can't sleep. So I turn on, uh, interesting, the city's channel and look at city council's hearings. So I looked at the hearing the other night um, with um, the DA on, um, testifying about his budget. And Krasner talked about Violence now being a flat line, if you look at the police statistics, there is a spike into shootings and homicides compared to um, previous, you know, last couple of years. Um, but I remember when I first started 30 years ago, when Father's Day Rally Committee first started, we stood on the corner broad and deride and called for a peace movement in the city where it was 501 murders in 1989, and I think in 1990, it was 531 or 36 murders, 385 plus were black males. So I know and understand that the numbers we see now are not compared to those numbers back in the early 90s, um, and even the or late 90s and 20s because of the crack epidemic. But at the same time, when you go into these neighborhoods and you hear from the neighbors the number of gunshots that are taking place and the number of folks who are being shot. Um, are, you know, those numbers, we don't talk, we always talk about the homicide numbers. The last time I looked at the numbers, I think we're something like nine, eight hundred, um, no, less than that, I'm sorry. We're averaging around eleven to 1,300 shootings per year. 
back in the days when we first started, we were averaging anywhere from 17, 18, 1900 per year. So I do, I'm well aware of the drop. Um, a lot of that has to do with community-based organizations out there really doing the work. A lot of that has to do with the police. Um, I now it's the, the good work the police do. You know, I always talk about how a lot of folks are not dead because when the police come on the scene and see a sh gunshot victim, they pick them up and get them directly to the hospital. The hospitals are some of the best trauma hospitals in the country. So with the police doing that, once you get to the hospital, trauma, and thank God, the very reason is I think half of these suckers don't know how to shoot. Um, so they're missing folks, uh, luckily. Um, so if you look at all that, I believe that us working together, once again, council really taking bold moves this year. If that means you have to fight with the mayor, then fight with the mayor. Um, the mayor has to understand that the neighborhoods, folks are suffering. I know too many young men that I know who have lost, or my friends who have lost children to violence. Um, and that is something that um, I thank God that never happened to me, and I thank God it never happens to me as being a father of five kids, 14 grandkids, and now two great grandkids. Uh, I've been very lucky, but a lot of my friends have not been lucky. Um, one of them is sitting next to me right now. So with that, I'd like to just, in my testimony, and consider my point that city really considers, council really considers, to look at the Baltimore Youth Child Fund and, and consider that, you know, that you, we do it in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and once again, let me just say this, politically it's an easy move for y'all because it's a ballot question. So you just take the position, put it on the ballot, and then let us organize and get the citizens to vote for it. With that, I end my testimony, Councilman Jones. Thank you, uh, Mr. Quayle. Um, we are going to hold questions until everyone on the first panel gets to testify, if that's okay with you. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael O.G. Law Taban. My name is Michael Taban as a citizen. My name is O.G. Law as a community pro-activist. And why I say pro-activist is because what I learned the hard way is activism should actually be called reactivism. Because we wait till something happens and then we react to it. And if anybody know boxing, whoever throw the first punch and connect in a round usually wins that round. So if we keep reacting, we'll never get in front of the problem. So I'm, I became a national pro-activist taking what I learned here in Philadelphia for the last 15 years, dealing with trauma before the hospital, right there on the street. I became a pro-activist because of that. And now we're beginning to get in front of the problem. Okay, what I learned in this situation is we have to look at this thing from the perspective of a surgeon and a trash man, okay? So you got this top of the line surgeon, he's in the hospital, we're gonna pay him $900,000 a year because he's such a great surgeon, right? When he cuts you open, you're gonna be right. We're gonna pay the trash man $10 an hour. But if the trash man stopped cleaning up the trash in the hospital, all the surgeon's patients will die because the, hosp the hospital will become toxic. So that means that the surgeon has to recognize the necessity of the trash man. I stand here in representation of the trash man. Some people think our children are trash. I think that one man's trash is another man's treasure. So I, I look at you guys as surgeons Y'all cutting open the communities, the budgets. I've stood in the top of the big buildings in City Hall and saw the eye view of the powerful. I can see why so many things get built and pushed around just standing up in those big rooms, but I hope the guys in the big rooms begin to recognize the necessity of the trash man. Or we will become like what the Bible described in the Old Testament, 
the statue that had the gold head, the silver body, the legs of iron, but the feet was made out of iron mixed with miry clay. And what that's talking about is the foundation that's holding you up is weak. So you can have all the big luxury up the top all you want. If you don't begin to take care of the bottom that's holding up, look, if it's an upper 1%, it got to be a lower 99 to hold you up. Now, if we hold you up and your cup runneth over, then it will become like the champagne glasses and everybody will get spilled and full. So I want to talk to you about solutions. The young people have given us a hand and we haven't utilized it. The young people created their own jobs based upon Camden, New Jersey, and began to go to the gas stations and pump gas. The only thing is they don't have a Sunoco shirt. They don't have a Getty shirt. They don't have uh, support. They actually get the managers chasing them away. And I'm telling you, as a person 15 years on the front line, when a person, grown or young, goes to a gas station to pump gas, that's the first step before they go commit a crime. Most likely robbery, because they're used to dealing with the public. In other words, why fight against these young people when we can take a page out of Camden, New Jersey as a solution immediately? Imagine if there's 5,000 gas stations in Philadelphia, you got three shifts a day, you got three grass, gas pumps, and you got all these people in these halfway houses and these community centers that will take an entry level position job, which will provide you the instant gratification and the band aid we need to keep them alive until we get to hospital so we can sew this injury up and deal with the bullet wall. Okay. Now, also, uh, I want to talk about uh, what do we say here? This is the, sorry, I don't see as well anymore, y'all guys. Uh, safety tips in a time of trouble. I'm consistently watching these videos and I stand as a professional of safety. You'll wonder how does OG Law be online in the trunk of the car with my son stopping him from shooting somebody and he's still alive, but these other guys keep getting shot or hurt during the process because these young people don't have training, okay? And what I was saying, uh, I'm sorry. Safety tips in the time of trouble. So it's training. We need to be able to train people, okay? I'll give you an example. How many times you watched a video of a lady walking down the street during the time where she's getting ready to get abducted in the car, or you heard she got raped, but they showed a tape of her walking down the street? Now, one safety tip that I learned in the street that works 90% of the time that could prevent a victim for a woman or somebody in trouble, even somebody that's about to get shot that's running, you ever notice that they always run past all the cars that stand in there? Each car got an alarm system in it. If you shake the car, the alarm system is going to ring. The one alarm is going to trigger the alarm of the cars next to it. So in other words, that's just one of my many safety tips like I teach the young people, stop wearing two headphones in your ear because you can't pay attention to what's going on around you. I believe that we need to begin to provide information with graphics that appeal to young people and old, with information that can help keep them alive immediately, at the same time while we begin to develop these programs. Um, finally, I wanna say that um, from building a budget standpoint, I believe that if we were to tap into, what are we looking for? Okay, yes sir. I would like to tap into the businesses. I'm gonna give you an example. Every business is in business to make money. Every time the police come to a community, the drug dealers don't make money. That's an illegal pharmaceutical distribution business that goes out of business. So the drug dealers don't necessarily like when the police come. So it's bad information to say that the drug dealer's doing the shooting. It's not, it's people in poverty and people in pain that's even robbing and killing the drug dealers now. If anybody know the streets, there's been a lot of major drug dealer old heads murdered lately. And so, I'm sorry, if you, if you know the streets, and I just, sorry, I was looking at uh, Mr. Ross because I know he know what I'm talking about. There's been a lot of old legendary drug dealers that's been murdered lately in the streets. There is a power shift taking place right before your eyes in the streets. 
And if you don't have your fingers on the pulse of the city, then the only thing you can do is make an educated guess with the lives of our children. So that brings me back to my clothes, which is the surgeon recognizing the need for the trash man. I have 15 years of information, just as, as many people as Mr. Ross can tell you that he solved the murder or crime, I can tell you how I prevented one at the Chinese store. Almost twice, three times a week in between all these deaths, and I can tell you how it was done. Sometimes I have to give up my last $40 in my pocket because I had my pack in the alleyway and he stole it. And so this is just one example of how I know for a fact that we can prevent a, a killing for $40. A police officer was murdered two years ago for $38. Right after I sat in front of the same city council and told them that $30 a day in somebody's pocket can prevent crime, but we'll spend $50,000 on an event to discuss it. Mr. Curtis Jones had the courage to give me a little leeway in the community, a 60th and master. I did a pilot program called the Handyman Program. The neighborhood thief who I left the equipment with, who his family used to be ready to kill him because he'd be robbing him. Last time I seen him, he still got the saw and the drill that we put in his hand because we looked at our children like phones. You can download applications in your phone. You can download an application in your child. You can delete an application from your phone. You can delete an application from your child. We downloaded the handicap, the, excuse me, the handyman application into our children on 60th and Master. Now they have guys who get hired by the neighborhood block people to clean out the alleyways because Mr. Curtis Jones made the suggestion of that's supposed to be the safety route for the old people to get through. So now we got people interested in these new jobs. Some, some of these older people only need their steps fixed. I had 12 kids in a moving van and everybody wanted to hire the moving van with the young black children that was trying to stay alive. So there are small initiatives and things that we can do together. There's information that I would like to present and provide that will tell you, like for instance, and I'm, I won't be long, but I hope you take this food for thought because it could keep somebody alive. The young black man has a meeting with me, and I learned why they don't listen to us older black men as a whole, and it became a trend. They really feel like we abandoned them, and it's that simple. When we were in prison, and they was out here fending for themselves when they got into their school fights and they dealt with it by themselves when they caught their venereal disease and they was by themselves. They felt like they had to become a man by themselves. And when we come out of jail, giving them advice, and if you look at the movie The Cage, where I contended for an Oscar this year on Vimeo, we shot a, a film called The Cage and CFCF, where we showed the phenomenon. But we have to get excited about the things that we do positive right now. I have a cape that's under your table. I drew a seven foot picture of Nipsey Hussle. And I'm gonna show you how, while people spend thousands of dollars to discuss how to get these young people engaged with positive activity, I took $150 and I've already been to two states and I'm invited to three more with some fabric, some markers, and some gorilla tape. And I would love to share this with you, but you might not believe it worked. So I drew a picture of Nipsey Hussle with a regular number two pencil, seven feet tall. I put the Marathon Continues, I put Crenshaw Blues on it. I took it to the Apollo in New York City. I ended up performing at the Apollo. The young people love to see the old hair rap because they love that I speak their language. When they saw Nipsey Hussle, they saw that their old hair respected and appreciated their culture right now. So now I have their loyalty, I have their ears, and I have over 3,000 signatures on this cape. Now the cape is going to be the longest cape in the world. The longest cape in the world right now, currently on record is held by a guy named Blue Peter in Europe. I actually have the, a longer cape than that I did for the Eagles, but now we have this Nipsey Hustle Marathon cape. We could get in front of it or behind it, but by the end of this thing, I'm gonna have over 100,000 signatures of these young people who actually want to live. 
And I'm doing it from the grassroots perspective to show, again, maybe you need the trash man because I know for a fact that if the grant writers would team up with the people who do the dirty work, we could actually make your program real by providing you the evidence beta, excuse me, evidence-based data, by providing you the proper programming that works, and y'all will actually be able to implement the proper structure for these programs to work. It will really be that simple. It's sad. I want to say this, and I'm going to close with this, and I'm done. But y'all think about this. When I walk in the door, I know it's like an elephant walk in a room, especially when I got my jail suit on. I done intimidated some of these powerful men in this room for years, walking in here with my chains swinging, looking all crazy. But you know what? I got all your attention. Meek Mills put me in his video. I got 70 million views with me. I shot a film called Fight Hate With Love that won the Cameras Film Festival featured in Time Magazine, Vanity Fair, Washington Post. I was on the cover of the New York Post in election time for 1.5 million people being uh, 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 gained the right to vote, all with this jail suit. And you know what it's called? It was just performance art. I just, God told me when I was in the jail cell to take jail outside of jail and show you jail before you got to go find the hard way yourself. So all these years you had nothing to be afraid of. All these years you could have reached out to me and we could do some great things together because I'm coming from an angle of, I did 15 years. I developed programs that would have worked for me that I never had. Why wouldn't you want to wrap your mind and your budget around that? You know what's going to work because I'm not only the president of the National Love Team, which stands for life over violence everywhere together, everyone accomplishes more. I'm also a client. I know, I know some of y'all done looked up my record to find out how crazy I will he really do it? He's chained himself to the Love Park sign for a week straight. I made history with that, by the way. And even though they got mad at me in Philly, I ended up speaking behind Dr. King pulpit in Alabama at the 50th because of that. It was just performance art. And guess what? The kids love it and it works. So I, I appreciate it much. If I'm not the only one, this man gets stressed out I feel so bad but good for this man because imagine, and, and, and this is a bad analogy, but it's an old joke, but I'm going to use it and they always chastise me anyway. But imagine throwing up a bucket of chicken in Africa where they ain't got no food at. What are all the people going to do? They're going to fight each other for that little bit of chicken, right? This man is a man who in the night hours while everybody else sleep. He got 15, 20 people on the phone with one bucket of chicken. And he be trying to keep everybody straight and it's pulling him apart. And he an old head. And I appreciate that he cared, but I'm saying it would be nice if everybody really did a little bit before, like Joel say. You might end up opening the door for your child's killer and then you'll be like me. Well, like when Shantae Wright, see y'all forgot. Shante Wright, my ex-girlfriend, got shot in the throat twice, shot in her back because she came back from Florida to be in the witness protection program, and she got killed in less than 48 hours. You remember that? You remember you walked with me through that when they killed my girl when I was out here trying to stop violence? They shot in the throat twice, and they shot her girlfriend. Remember our grandma died in the hospital the day after that? That's what I went through. That's what changed me. So when I say become a pro-activist, it's so that it can avoid you from going through the pain that'll make you do something about it to help somebody else. Don't y'all see the pattern? All the people who run the best nonprofits had the foot up there behind the worst. Why don't we think proactively? An ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of the cure. Peace thank, and love. Thank you for your testimony. Um, good afternoon, Curtis good afternoon. Uh, Councilman Jones and Councilman Greenlee. Uh, my name is Stanley Crawford, and I come with the other perspective of what this meeting is about. Um, my son, William Crawford, was murdered September the 8th, 2018. Um, he was 35 years old, had five children. 
um, he, it was a Saturday morning around nine o'clock in the morning. He was going to his sister house and was ambushed, shot once in the right temple, once in the jar, and shot in his chest. Um, my sister, my daughter, his sister, opening up the door, and can you imagine going down at the bottom of the steps, seeing your brother laying there, for all intents and purposes, dead? And my grandson comes out and see my son laying in the street dead. So as a result of that death, me and my other son, we was on our way, going somewhere. Matter of fact, we might have been on our way to our house. And to hear her scream over the phone and to have that pain and misery in my spirit. So this topic that we are here for about violence, reducing the violence, to some people it might be a theory, it might be something that's just a part of the everyday existence, but until you experience this, it's not no joke. You know, I was here when they had the hearing and um, the officials, the department heads come up and they come up with a plan on how they're gonna use 31.5 million dollars over six years to help with, a, with, a, with the violence in the city. You know, um, since it's been almost eight months, uh, matter of fact, uh, May the 5th would be the eighth month of the death of my son. Also, I'd like to get some contents to it. You know, um, my son, I raised him from three as a single father up until he turned 18 and started doing stuff on his own. I remember taking him to school every morning and then picking him up every afternoon. I made sure that whatever love he had for me as a father, he got. And um, to be sitting up here today, man, and to really be going through what I'm going through as uh, experiencing. See, there's a point where people say you experience something, but when you are in the experiencing process, it's a whole different animal. You know, I remember uh, this Saturday, uh, we had a meeting at, at the organization that we created as a result of the death of my son. And I was um, chairing the meeting, and um, I was, unbeknownst to me, I was breaking down as a result of just speaking about my son. You know, and also experiencing the rippling effect that this, his murder caused throughout my family. My family is a loving and caring family, a great big family. And to see my daughter every day telling me I miss my brother, right? Um, to be with his children and um, knowing that they themselves miss their father, you know, and um, to be a part of this whole experience of losing a loved one to violence. That's why when you hear me speak, I never say my son died. I never say uh, other than what the truth is, he was killed, he was murdered. And I don't wanna put no um, um, soft um, 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 meaning to what occurred to him, right? So as I started to really contemplating and, and experiencing that, uh, something came over me and something came over me that I need to do something to help another family from not having had to have this experience. You know, because like I say, there's nothing I could do to bring my son back. But what can I do to make sure that number one, my son's death was not in vain, and number two, to help another family from not having this experiences. And as a result of that, on January the 5th, I put a call out, and the call was answered. And we have the minimum, the minimum of 30 to 50 brothers that come out every week on a Saturday from two to four and been meeting for almost five months, trying our best to put an organization together that we can get out into the community and make a difference. And that's the Black Mill Community Council of Philadelphia. Uh, we're gonna have our first call out, which would be May the 11th at Imhotep Charter School. So this is something that's, that, that we're talking. I heard the brother talk about solutions, and I hear Blau always been in the solution category. But what can we do? One of my thoughts was this. We as black men in the community 
have to realize that ain't nobody coming to our rescue. And we sit, and, and, and I, I was guilty of it too. So I'm not saying that I was not guilty of this. I would look at the news and hear about a murder and I never went past the person who was murdered. But my experience has now shown me that that one murder might affect the minimum of 100 or so people. So when we look at TV and we say it was one murder, then we really don't realize how many people is affected by that one murder. Now just take the murderer, the person who was murdered, now let's look at the murderer. When the murderer is caught, if they're caught, and that's what I'm gonna get uh, uh, captured, I'm gonna get into a little bit of that too because the police commission is here, and I have done, done some research as a result of the death of my son. And some of the statistics even add to my, 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 my pain and agony. I'll give you an example. The chief inspector's son was killed, what, a, about a couple of three weeks ago? Right away, it was a $35,000 reward put out that same day. Then, in two or three days, that person who murdered that chief inspector's son was captured. If a white folks get killed in the black community, you can bet your bottom dollar within a week or so that person is going to be caught. If a police officer is killed, ain't no two days, one day, they're going to get caught. But when us in, the, in our community, like my son, my son was killed eight months ago, almost eight months ago. I know people, family members been killed. Zachariah's son was killed in 2017, unsolved murders. In 2018, it was 60% of the murders in 2018 out of 351 is unsolved. There's an article right here that was by Bobby Allen, December 28th, 2018. In that article, it states that sometimes the solving of a murder depends on the enthusiasm of the homicide detective. So when we start to looking at what's taking place realistically, if I was a murderer and I live and I was, and, and I did business in Philadelphia, I'd take my chances. Because 60% of the murders in 2018 and over a 10-year period, period, 45% of the murders was unsolved. I talked to a sister just the other day. Her brother was murdered in 2000, and this is 2019. His murder is still unsolved. So what I'm saying is this, um, councilman and councilwoman, not only do we, the public, have to experience the loss of our loved ones, now you have statistics like this that is even add to our grieving. And then I hear sometimes, I hear the politician, I hear the, hear the, hear, hear the, the, the they please giving excuses to us why our murders can't be solved, but I don't hear that when it comes time for solving other people's murders. And then we, the, 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 the victims of the murderer, is now charged with not coming forth and doing what we well, what they say we should do is is, is it's, it's, an, it's not a no snitching culture within inside of our community. There's other parameters that is a, that I can't speak about right now at this particular meeting that is involved with why it could be hazardous to your health. The brother spoke about it. His his old lady spoke up, got murdered. So I'm saying to the, to the panel, I'm coming not from the, 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 the monetary perspective, because I thought Bilal did a great job speaking about the monetary. But I'm talking about from the experience as a human being that had to sit up here today and know certain things that I can't say at this meeting and know that my son murder is not even to the best of my knowledge being given any attention. I tell you, uh, uh, Councilman Jones, at this point, nobody is calling me. I'm, I, here's my son, been murdered. I didn't talk to people, and right now, the, all the people that I talk to, nobody's called me back. So I'm sitting here, man, I'm sitting here, and, 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 and one, one thing I say this here is this. The murder of my son, I made a commitment to him. I'm going to do whatever necessary that I have to do to make sure my son murder don't become a cold case. Okay? Because I love my son. 
And my son did not, he don't deserve to be a cold case. And if we're going to be sitting up here talking about violence, you cannot leave the murderers in our midst with the comfortability of murdering and there's no consequences. So, you know, and, 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 and you know, um, I just like to talk a little bit now about the Black Male Community Council of Philadelphia. And in Blau, we had it, we been had, and I, and, and I went to Blau House about uh, three or four weeks ago, Blau. And I thank Blau because he gave me an audience for about three hours, me and him talk. And I am not bitter to the point that I want to do anything to cause anybody else's family any harm. But I am a human being and I do have some humanity and I want to be able to do whatever I can to make sure another family, if we can help them, not have to have this experience, man. So the Black Male Community Council, on May 11th, we have a call out at M. Hotep Charter School. And here go, um, here go uh, a, a couple of palm cards that, you, that they could give out. And the goal is what? To get the black men to come out of these buildings, come out of these masses, come out of these churches, come out of these institutions of higher learning, come out of them sports arenas, and let's get back into the community and get in the streets and start being what I call show our women, children, and elders that we out there trying to help them and protect them. So the Black Male Community Council is, came up with four specific things that we're gonna be focusing on. Security, cleanup, mediation, and education. And we picked five hot spots that we're gonna be working in. 16th and Susquehanna Avenue, 12th and Huntington, um, 16th and Wing and Hawken, um, 58th and Baltimore, and, and around 23rd and Reed in South Philly. These are the five hot spots we're working in. The goal is to get 100 black men, and we want black men. We don't want women, we don't want other nationalities. We want black men to come out of these buildings, come out of these institutions, and let's put 100 black men in each one of them areas. And let's, black men, the 100 black men is gonna do this not one day, not, we're gonna do it from Monday to Saturdays, from sunup to sundown, and we wanna be in the community doing security, cleanup, mediation, because this is this another thing. Listen, a lot of these young brothers have a problem with, what, with another young brother. The reason why we're having this murder because they don't have any options. If Joe Blow deal with an issue with a gun and, and, and he know the other brother deal with an issue with a gun, he got to get his gun because if he run into the other brother that deal with an issue with a gun, they're going to clash and one of them going to wind up dead and one of them going to wind up in jail. So our goal is to put a mediation team together in each one of these hot spots so when they do have a problem, they may choose to come to us and say, oh, head, I got a problem with so-and-so. Can you help me? I, want, I don't want to hurt him, and I don't want him to hurt me. That's the mediation. So what we're doing is trying our best to reach out in the community. And, that, and, 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 and our, our model is boots on the ground. I heard you say that when we first started. Boots on the ground all hands on deck, and consistent consistency. See, our thing is this. If we are out there cleaning, not, I mean, every day, we got a, a cleanup committee that goes in and keep this area spick and clean every day, that's gonna change the spirit of the people. And if we did it for 90 days, the first 90 days, people get used to being in a clean environment as compared to a dirty environment. If we have an education committee, what we call the Black Mill uh, round table on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we put a call out to the black men in that community that you can meet at such and such a location and let the old heads and the young boys have a discussion on something that's pertinent. So this is our, 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 our four um, 90 day boots on the ground, four areas action committees, and we hope to make a difference. And the goal is to be consistent. That means that not after the first 90 days we're gonna stop, we're gonna be assessing all the way through the process and we're gonna be recruiting all the way through the process. So if we're successful, we can duplicate this in other areas. So as I just shared up here and shared with you my personal pain and agony, out of that pain and agony, I pray that it gives some type of solution because if we keep sitting the way we're sitting and we don't do anything, we know we're gonna keep getting the same results. 
So that's basically what I have to say today to the council. Before I respond, I want to recognize Helen Gim, who is here and joined us on this committee. Um, and first and foremost, I want to um, I, I want to give you my sincere condolences for your loss. Um, as you know, uh, my nephew Terry, a couple years before you, before even Zach, was murdered in that same uh, general area. Uh, his murder has not been found. Um, I want you to know um, that that rippling effect is not just 100 families you're talking about on that day, but um, seeing my grandson off on his prom was his son. Mm. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's a rippling effect that like a, a, a petal in a pond, it goes far and wide. And you don't know all of the impacts it will have over a period of time. The absence of a father creates almost a, a um, generational impact that you wonder why at a certain age when his manhood came, how, how he's beginning to react to things. So uh, my condolences. I got two of your um, uh, goals. One was security, the other was cleanup. Can you give me the other two? Mediation. Mediation. And uh, education. Go ahead. And education. Okay. Um, the other thing that I like about, well, Bilal gave uh, seven uh, different recommendations that we are going to explore and take all of them seriously. One of them we need to uh, take a look at to see if you mentioned at the state level they might, uh, particularly, no, it was, it, was, it was OG, about the gas station and whether or not that is something that has to be authorized above our pay grade. But if it is not, if it is some action we can take, I think we should explore at least that idea. It comes with other unintended consequences like insurance and this and that, but we have to figure that out. I, we, I, I just would like to say um, I wouldn't mind uh, taking a trip over to New Jersey uh, mm -hmm. Just, they are very open. I work with a lot of youth in Camden, and I'm not saying me. It could be anybody. Let's let's go talk to New Jersey and find out how does that work, because my mom don't like to get out her car to pump gas. She like going to New Jersey, so they figured out how to do it. Let's because think about it. It could be 15,000 jobs entry level overnight that will empty out D and Airy halfway house empty out Germantown Avenue, and all the youth that already do it will have a position. So, so I've heard you mention this before, and you gave a little more colorful analogy <laughs> if, 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 at your poetry slam. Uh, you know, I, I kind of remember the other part you, for polite TV, okay, but I got the other part too, what you said. Yes, so um, question, do you think this is an organized effort by the elements that are committing these crimes? Well, when I was here um, for the hearing, you talking about the, 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 the effort that you guys is putting forth? No. Okay. What is happening in the violence in Oh, 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 without a shadow of a doubt. I think I'm, I, I would like to have an audience with the, with the police commissioner. As a result of the death of my son, I have undercovered some information that has astonished me. And this violence that we are experiencing is not as simplistic as we think it is. And as a result of, 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 of what have uncovered, there's layers that's taking place that is unknown to the public, number one, and also, I believe, to some of the law enforcement agencies. You know, because at the end of the day, you know, we think that every murder is over some frivolous girlfriend, boyfriend, or just some simple argument. And what I uncovered is not as simple as that. Uh, and well, I, you should have a private conversation, but one of the things that disturbs me 
Um, and I wanted you to know that it doesn't just affect people on that side of the table, it affects us all. Um, was that in one instance, it was almost like a winkity wink, like, well, you know he was in that lifestyle. Correct. Well, you know he was out there. And, and to, to some extent, I, I can process that information, but the tears of that mother ain't no different than the tears of Correct. other people's mothers. And closure is like an important thing um, for, for the kid. Bless you, young child. It's an important part of this because kids go around with a grudge. I tell people, it's not the one that's popping off. I'm a, oh, I'm a, he's tearing off clothes and he's running out. It's the one that ain't saying nothing mm -hmm. that you better watch because he's internalizing his hurt and it man manifests itself later that night or some other time. And these kinds of things, it's, it's almost sometimes Hatfield and McCoy. Um, I have two, two neighborhoods, and I'm, I'm gonna let other people talk, but two neighborhoods, 54th Street and 58th Street. And some of the back and forth is generational. So we have to, we have to do some things different um, to, to try to combat this. Now, um, witnesses are important. I'm, I'm, not, I'm never going to not acknowledge some things we can do better. One of the reasons why we aggressively went after the camera program is that it doesn't put anybody, camera is fearless and, and doesn't lie, it's right there. You, you, you view it for yourself. And, but the key of it is not just cameras, but intelligence behind the cameras. The, the begot, so he begot and they begot and putting out that detective thing together to be able to solve some of these things. 60% unsolved is unacceptable. Can I say one thing? One thing is this, um, Councilman. I was talking to my daughter yesterday and I was explaining to her, when a person get a cold, they get a cough, they get a fever, they get sneezy and they get running, running noses, whatever have you. But it's the virus that is causing all of this to occur. And if we don't get into the virus, we're gonna keep just looking at the runny nose, the sneeze, and stuff like that. So when you go, to, when we when we look at this violence, and and and, and, and this something that I didn't see that occur, Councilman, is and, and Council Councilwoman, is this? Okay, take a person like myself. How about sitting down and forming a council or conference? where we can actually brainstorm and get to the virus as compared to just dealing with the cold and the symptoms. You know, I'll give you an example. I raised my son in, 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 in I believe, in an upright manner, right? But what was it that was, that, 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 um, that, that superseded what I was putting in him and we're not dealing with that element? Like the brother was saying, you can't tell a hungry person not to feed themselves. So if you don't create a, 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 a program like Sultan Ahmed was talking about, if we could take $300 million and tear down buildings, we take another $300 million and put in this um, a new program that we got, but we're not putting $300 million in building up people. So when Sultan Ahmed is proposing a bond issue to help, with the, with the, with the, to help build people, we have to consider that too as part of the solution. And as a result of us looking in and having a conference and getting together and then looking and seeing what we could do to, for the total situation instead of just the, 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 the 300, just think about it, let's, let's be real. $31.5 million over five years, and then you're giving six million of that to L&I. So when you take that, you only got 29 million left. Um, 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 really, 25 million. If you got 31, just think about it. $31.5 million over, over five years, that's $6 million in something a year, right? Now you're taking $6 million of that, which really breaks it down to $25.5 million, and then $12 million of that, I think you're giving to the police department, if I'm not, not mistaken. So when you start to really divvy it out, and then you got the administration fee that's gonna come out of there. So by the time it hit the streets to the people we say we're gonna help, we're giving smidgen, we, we really, what we're doing, Councilman, we are putting spit on the inferno. 
You understand what I'm saying? That's what we're doing. So we have to be serious, and we have to really sit down as, 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 as with people like Bilal Karun, people like myself, who can sit down and let's come up with a practical and applicable short range, long range, medium range, and long range plan to help the people who we're supposed to be trying to help. Chair recognizes, oh, Chair recognizes Councilman Greenlee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank to all three of you. And uh, Ms. Crawford, I think we all share what the Councilman said about the condolences to you and your family and what you've had to go through. Uh, Mr. Quayu, um, if I could ask a little bit more about the Baltimore situation you talked about. Yes. Um, I know they, uh, Baltimore has a lot of serious problems down there too. It was a cover story in the New York Times Magazine about a month ago. Um, so this, um, this fund, is that like sort of an umbrella over all the different programs? Is that how it's being? It's, it's a fund that is, um, it doesn't come from city government. They created an entity Okay. to manage the fund. Mm -hmm. And they then issue RFPs where groups can apply for it. Um, and it's, um, once again, was the $10 million per year that the fund creates through the, the, the whatever percentage, and I don't have the percentage mm -hmm. of whatever percentage was taking out of the real estate taxes. But the important thing was that it was uh, they were struggling with how to help groups in Baltimore, mm -hmm. same way we're struggling in the city right. of Philadelphia. And this was a um, councilmatic action. The council actually did this. It wasn't the city of Baltimore administration, the mayor. Um, so, but the good part about it is that they also, this fund understand, has a technical assistance part of the, the operation to help the smaller groups who have will struggle to, you know, try to, you know, sustain themselves. Um, but it's, it's a great idea when you think about $10 million in a pot, that's every year. So if an organi organization gets in and is doing great work, they don't have to really worry about sustaining themselves to continue to do that work in, in, in every year. I mean, they, they do other kind of fundraising and stuff, but it's, it's a great idea. So it's a commitment of ten, uh, ten million dollars every year. It's the, That's what the, the, whatever the percentage. Know it's coming. Yeah, whatever the percentage is that was voted on, um, coming out of the tax dollars, the property taxes. That's what the the, the dollar amount was ten okay. ten million per year. How long has it been going on? Do you know? They, this uh, this is the first year. I think it was this first past year. in two sixteen. Okay. Have to look into that more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Jen. Thank you very much, Councilman. Um, and, you know, Mr. Crawford, we grieve for you and your family. Um, and thank you for being here to share uh, your stories. Um, one of the things that we've been working on um, a bit has been taking a look at uh, young people because while victims of violence can range all across any age group, Obviously, um, oftentimes, uh, as you noted, people who perpetrate violence within communities, one, are often victims of violence themselves, can, can often be victims of violence themselves, so they endure a significant amount of pain, trauma, um, feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. And then, uh, secondarily, they're young. They skew young. Um, you know, they are, uh, they sometimes have their first interactions through our juvenile justice system. I've been working very closely to take on the issue of youth in residential uh, treatment facilities. Um, we've been very aggressive about making sure that young men and women who go into these facilities are actually taken care of, that they have re rehabilitation and health, that if we're going to separate them from their families, um, that we do it for short periods of time and not for years on end. That's been a really important issue. Um, but I do worry that uh, we don't have those kinds of, uh, you know, programs that we're really thinking through. Um, well, really quickly, what I will also say is, and we've been aggressive about shutting down abusive facilities like Wordsworth um, or like a Glen Mills where uh, it's a physical facility um, where young people who are already struggling with a lot of issues in their lives um, are faced with um, aggressive behaviors, um, abuse, uh, some many times physical abuse, um, 
where they're subjected to physical restraints, chokeholds, strip searches, solitary confinement. This is not rehabilitation and health. We spend an enormous amount of money, uh, Mr. Chairman, on this area, um, over $100 million on the city end and tens of millions of dollars on the school district end, um, and we need a lot more. So I'm curious about whether um, you know, some of the recommendations or suggestions are targeted towards younger people in that category between the ages of, I don't know, like 15 to 28 or 15 to 30 or somewhere in those areas where they're just, they're very high risk, they're also very vulnerable, but they're also very impressionable. They can change. Um, it's not a fixed life for them. Um, and, and of course, you know, because they're so young, one of the hallmarks and psych psychological things we know about young people is that they do think of life in very short um, time frames. They don't think of it as 20 years down the road, I'll get my degree, I'll do this, I'll you know, make plans, I'll have a pension, I'll do you know, such and such. Um, they do think very short term, so helping young people through a period of time when you know, they are maturing, their brains are developing, they're making, you know, they have the capacity to think of better choices is a really important issue for me. Chair of Children and Youth on the Public Safety Committee. Um, we're trying to figure it out on the residential treatment side, but I'm interested in hearing some of your recommendations on how young people who are uh, our most vulnerable and also our highest risk category are being part of the solution to coming up with, you know, what are the things that, that we're hearing and what, what additional supports can we do um, for them? Well, I want, just quickly, and I appreciate your attention and your comment. I'm, I'm right there with you as far as, I, I, I think in short, we, we know it's a mental health thing. So I do sidewalk therapy. We can't be scared to look at the truth about our children. The first step to fixing a problem is acknowledging that the problem exists. We're dealing with per, per, parental pride a lot of times, where the parent won't even admit. Now, if I can't tell you, I'm out in the streets. Everybody could go online and see it. But if I or somebody else out there in the street with your child can't even tell you about your child, you, won't, you can't believe that this is your child? I mean, if somebody say they're getting C notes for deep throats, well, what do that mean? And if they wear a pink wig when they say this, and then your daughter start wearing a pink wig, just like the girl that says she gets C notes for deep throats. You ever thought that your daughter might be getting C notes for deep throats? Or is it too heavy for you to realize that your daughter might be one of them girls that cost $40 for a perk? Can we talk real? Can you handle the truth about your children? Can you handle that she might leave out your house with this outfit on, go down the street to her girlfriend and turn into a whole other person before she get to school? Can you handle the truth about your own child? Because when I go to these funerals, I see that parents are still lying at the funeral. You knew he had a gun under the pillow. You saw him online. These kids is publicly disrespecting you now. So come on, man, but when you get to the funeral, you're still lying. Now, how can we as real people fix a situation when everybody's still lying about the issues that's going on? I didn't want to be that harsh, but honestly, these are the conversations that are going to have to take place in order to get to the rotten core of the issue. Look at this. Don't air out your dirty laundry is the new talk. My grandmother used to take my dirty laundry and hang it out in the air and to get the cool summer breeze. But now you'd rather me go to the store and buy some fake cool summer breeze in a bottle while you're telling me don't air out my real dirty laundry and we're wondering why this thing is stinking up the place. I want to get real with somebody that wanted, if anybody want to get famous, because a lot of people want to get famous, a lot of people want to be looked at as smart because they can type grants. I type 70 words a minute, by the way, learned in prison. But my point is this, then, then if you are opportunists even, then come holler at me, Mr. Opportunist, because you could get famous for stopping this violence. 
Oh, I used to love the attention I got when I was a criminal. And now that God allowed me to become a hero, it feels just as exhilarating as when I was a criminal. Look at this. I could be right here in court right now with a murder case. Right now, I shot 17 people. I know when I get to jail, I'm going to be known as a rider. I might get to holler at one of the guards, and if I could get some drugs in the jail, I'm going to have it my way anyway. But look at this. Now, my young people are going to be able to look online and see me standing up here fighting for their lives as a hero. These are the things that make the impression and give you access to the street government you're talking about, the one that the, the people, the warden in prison will come to certain inmates to squash the beef because deep down inside they know it's only 200 officers and 2,000 inmates. You can't really contain it when they don't want to be contained anymore. So you could go find the container. So it's an invisible street government that prevents crime and violence, that's underfunded, thirsty, and again, it's gonna be like the tower, heavy at the top. Now, last thing, and I'm gonna shut up again, and I'm, then I'm gonna walk out, and I'm gonna undo Ooh, my cape so leave. you can sign. No, SOS is a movement I created. It's called Summer On To September. We have people lining up on board. Our goal is to simply help our children make it from summer to September, safe, sound, alive, and free. And we have some great activities and things that they can be a part of, and including making them some money. Because look at this. The school will tell them, hey, sell cookies, cakes, and candy bars that rot your teeth and give you diabetes. The lady at the front door going to snatch up all the bread. We're going to give you a paper airplane that you... Look, you just raised us 8000 in candy, and you get a... A paper airplane, but the kid really see the bag. The kids, kids are smart. They looking like, like the old lady at the front desk, the one with the bag. So now you got this hungry kid thinking about robbing the old lady at the front desk because, yeah, they're using all 500 of us to go out in the community and sell candy like we don't know sugar is a drug. And they collect all the money. They all break it down. Then they give us a little airplane and a yo-yo from 1974. You think these kids are stupid. How about you send me into the school, I create the same seven piece of paper brochure, but I take the kids' positive promotional products that you didn't see me teach every kid in the city how to make t-shirts. Why did you do that, OG Law? Because it was an underground economic stimulus program I created, and it worked. They all eaten. Every time you go to my youngins and get one of your t-shirts made, it was me in the background teaching them how to do it, pulling the string. While I'm saying this, oh, you want glory? This is your 15 minutes of fame. No, God just put this burden on my back, and it's heavy. Sometimes I feel like I got the cure for HIV in my pocket, but I can't believe it, and I got to watch the people I love die. If Michael Jordan can be that good at basketball, and Kobe Bryant could that be that good, and Serena Williams could be that good at tennis, and we can identify these players, read their stats and all that, you mean to tell me you don't know who the hottest internet sensations are at keeping our children out of prison in early grave? You don't know OG Law with the jail suit? You don't know we famous for helping to save our children? Our record is sending kids home? If you can identify the running back and the basketball player, and it, stop worrying about being smart. Identify the best plan God gave to somebody anointed. And since you appointed to the position, let the anointed work with the appointed and get this work done and stop playing with the lives of these people. We don't need another meeting. We need to back what already worked. I love y'all. I'm done talking. Thank y'all for letting me have my 15 minutes to talk. <laughs> Um, See, well, are you done? Miss no, 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 William, can Somebody you else. read the next panel? Thank you for your testimony, guys. Thank you. Brandon Jones, Darren Tolliver, and Najah Muhammad. Brandon Jones, Darren Tolliver, and Naja Muhammad. Is uh, Ruben Jones and Daryl Schuler. Step up.
I'm not texting. I'm not. Thank you for your patience. Please bring okay. the mic close to you. State your name and begin your testimony, please. Uh, my name is uh, Naji uh, Muhammad. Uh, thank you uh, for having me uh, to come uh, to the council. And I thank everybody that is here. Um, I was looking forward to have more people here. I think, you know, something of this magnitude, uh, there should be many and much more people here concerned about the uh, issues that is going on here in Philadelphia. Once again, my name is Naji Muhammad. I want to start off, um, uh, my brother, uh, Stanley Crawford, I know exactly how you feel. Uh, I had lost my son in uh, 2009. Uh, he was uh, driving down as some passenger, yeah, 95, right in the outskirts of Philadelphia. And uh, he had got stopped from the uh, state police. And from that point that he uh, got taged uh, six to seven times. And three days later, he, uh, he died. Uh, from that point, he was, uh, the remains of him was buried at Mount Moriah. As you know, the cemetery had been abandoned since uh, 2011. Uh, he's buried right there on 60th and uh, Springfield Avenue in Southwest Philadelphia. And um, uh, City Council Blackwell, she's been really working with me, uh, working in that area. I have, I have been working there since the closing of the cemetery. Um, I had started off, as you know, it, it, uh, it became to be like a jungle in that particular area. Uh, in fact, that area, uh, on 60th and Springfield is the area where the Muslims are buried at. So um, it really been uh, a hor a horrifying view to look at. You know, a cemetery such as that magnitude that looks like a uh, at that time looked like a a jungle. So I started off with a residential lawnmower in one particular area where the remains of my son was. And uh, I was blessed to get a commercial one that you walk behind, which I was able to get more, uh, I can cover more as far as cutting the grass. And then later on, I was blessed to get a, a zero lawnmower, where in fact, I pay out my own pocket to, to uh, make that happen. So today, 2019, it's a very beautiful cemetery. Um, every year I had an annual uh, call out that the community would come out and they would uh, support uh, the cleanup and things of that nature. Uh, I was able to put a beautiful sign up there that gives a quotation from the Holy Quran. Also, there are benches that is out there where people can sit down and reminisce and just think about their loved ones. Um, it's very, very beautiful. So I just wanted to say I, I feel for Brother Stan. And what makes me move like I move to do what I do. I mean, every two weeks I go out there by myself and I maintain that area. It takes me about three hours to do that, but I do it by myself. And, you know, people in the neighborhood say, wow, you must really love your son. And that's one of the things that really moves you is love. And that's one of the things that uh, Brother Stan Crawford that moves him is love. So, you know, I take my hat off for him. Also, I wanted to, uh, I see that the uh, police commission is here and I thank him for being here. Uh, you know, there's a lot have been going on within the major cities of the United States with racial profilings and things of that nature. I understand that there, there will be at least 50 new police officers that will be uh, coming uh, or will be higher, and I will ask if, if the police commissioner, uh, Ross, if he can do a psychological profiling on these police officers. Because I think it's very important that a lot of people who want jobs, they just want jobs to get paid, and then you have people just want to be involved into other activities may not really be a part of the job that they're supposed to be doing. So you have a lot of crooked cops 
that is not just here in Philadelphia, but throughout the whole United States. That they come in not just to uphold the law, but they come here to do other things that they should not uh, be doing. So I think it's important that uh, the police commissioner or the FOP, that they would really look into uh, people who they hire, because it's very important. Uh, some of the issues that I really believe that is going on here in uh, particularly in Philadelphia, it's the educational system. As you know, throughout uh, Philadelphia, the city, uh, many of the public uh, schools have, have been shut down for, for whatever reason. And of course, you have many uh, teachers who had came into, uh, to be a teacher. They didn't come in to actually to be a teacher, but just to get paid. So you have a lot of people who want jobs, but they're not really sincere of what they do. Uh, I think um, the problems within uh, the crime here in Philadelphia is education. And we talk about jobs, okay, we need jobs, but mainly we need education. But, you know, when you are in a community, a poor community, you and have a school, schooling, a public schooling, and you have teachers that really don't care, don't really love the children, it can bring about bad results. And these are the things that have been happening, again, not just here in Philadelphia, but throughout the whole country. And I think um, we need teachers that will be able to look at children and love them like their own. Many of the public schools, you ha we have many children in schools where, in fact, in one room you can have 25 or 30 children in the room where, in fact, that doesn't really work good. I really believe that it should be less children in rooms and also it should be the same male, all boys in the same classrooms up to the age of 16 as the same that they should be all girls in the same classroom up to the age of 16. Uh, there have been statistics that uh, working in that fashion, it really enhanced the children tremendously. And again, I think that's one of the issues that we have here is the educational system and people who are comes in position of being teachers not really uh, loving their children as they, they should. I, I may add to that there are many um, mothers and fathers, particularly, uh, that may not do a good job at home. And I think uh, one of the things that we need to do too is is we need to visit homes and see how parents are living, sit down and talk with them. Talk with them, what's going on with your child, or what's going on with your children. Have council meetings to see what the, the, the kind of environment that they live and how they live. I think that's very important. But what disturbs me is that everybody should be aware of it. It was, a, uh, it was on international media that there was a one, young woman who had a uh, child, and she, um, she lied, fabricated, and said that she lived at this particular address where the school was much better uh, for uh, her child, and they found out that the child did not live there, and the result of that, she had uh, got arrested. And then that creates another problem there, too. And you know they looked at her as she was a criminal, but basically, the root of that whole thing is, is love. And, and she wanted her child to be in a, a more better environment, a more better learning uh, atmosphere. And you know, many of the people looked at her as a, a criminal. Of course, you know, when you go and look at these other communities where people are paying higher taxes, property taxes, they re, they're looking for to have better uh, schooling. And in that fact, you know, the place that she lived was a more so of a, a poor community where in fact she wanted the best for a child. Uh, you have uh, $30,000 per year annual on gun violence. And that is a crisis uh, in uh, America. Also you have uh, what, $8.6 billion uh, in uh, shooting gun violence where people are being uh, taken to emergency and uh, medical care. 
and that is a crisis uh, with, that we have. So I, I would say that the solution to the issues that we have is the educa educational system that we have here and that we have to really look back into uh, and, and study that is, is, it would be very uh, good if we can have less children in rooms and also uh, to have people, good teachers, that would be able to love uh, their children just like they would love their own. So that's one of the issues that we have. And um, just in my closing, I know that the, uh, the NRA and the MBA in 2015, the NBA wanted to do a ad. It was around uh, December of 2017 or 16 where they want to do an ad for gun violence. And they didn't really want to get in particularly into as far as put the guns down or we need to stop selling guns. They didn't really want to get into that part. But I think, you know, to order to really make a change, we have to step on some shoes. And even though that we have the uh, in our, uh, uh, the, in, uh, the gun association, that we need to really sometimes, you know, do what's right. And uh, that's one of the problems that we have. And when you have people who's robbing and stealing, they, they not doing it for joy, they doing it because lack of education, lack of jobs and things of nature. And you know, when you have a poor education that you're gonna have in result of that, everything else is gonna follow behind with that. So as I had started in the beginning, Again, I will hope that when uh, these uh, police officers come into uh, the city of Philadelphia, that they will be more lenient and um, that they would understand that there are issues that we have concerning about the violence that we have. And if uh, Commissioner Ross can do somewhat a one-on-one uh, -on, -one on each one, and just to see where they're at, that would be beautiful. And uh, thank you for allowing me uh, to speak. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to allow the panel to speak, and then we'll ask questions. Yeah, First of all, I want to say thank you, Mr. Muhammad, for your words. I really appreciate it. And I, I can't, uh, unfortunately, just finish out, even though I'm very interested in hearing from Mr. Jones. But um, I, I will be absolutely following up on testimony because I'm interested in some of the community investment reinvestment work that you're doing. And in particular, I wanted to follow up. Um, and if you speak to it, I'll be following in and my staff are here. Um, but about that question about young people, you know, involving them, a lot of the work that we did around our youth in residential uh, placement and treatment facilities started with a hearing with young people themselves talking about what their experiences were like in these facilities and why we needed to do take so much more action to uh, reduce the number of, of young people in, in, in those kinds of facilities, many of them are for profit, but also uh, to ensure that the time that they spend there is really focused in on rehabilitation, health, getting them the educational support and services that they need, and then figuring out reintegration back into family, school, and community, um, and other opportunities. So I know you have a lot of experience in this area. I know you've worked with young people, um, and you know really appreciate and value your experience, uh, Ruben. And so I'll be looking forward to, to hearing your full testimony and then following up with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rubin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruben Jones. I currently serve as the um, campaign coordinator for Close the Creek. I'm also executive director of Frontline Dads, Inc., but I'm also a long-term resident of Philadelphia, having grown up here. Um, in 2002, I returned home from serving a 15-year prison sentence, only to have uh, my youngest nephew murdered, shot in the head, um, so we talk about unsolved uh, murders and we talk about street violence. Um, it, it hits close to home for me personally. I've also had a young cousin who was murdered as a result of domestic violence by her boyfriend at the time uh, who murdered her in front of her children. So you can imagine the traumatic shock that, that exploded in my family as a result. 
but as a community organizer and activist who's been um, leading the charge for and violence prevention for years in this city, I just want to touch on a couple of things that, that I hope will, will resonate. Um, and, and I hate to, you know, sometimes I feel like I walk into a room and I'm always the most cynical person in the room um, or, or, or angry or frustrated or whatever. And while I applaud the, the efforts, particularly of this, this, this commission and um, with the administration making strides towards, you know, making these community grants and the police commissioning and the efforts he's made, what I do want to stress is that we can't continue to put band-aids on broken bones. And I said that to say that we are in a crisis. I served on the mayor's transition team back in 2015 or so. And I served on the Public Safety Commission uh, of that transition team. And I handed in a report uh, that said, you know, due to the violence in this city, we need to declare the public health crisis. We need to pump money, not into, and this is, I don't say this to demean anyone's effort, but not into basketball games and not into like this feel good stuff that happens in the moment but really infusing resources into ne neglected communities. And I said it because uh, we spent a lot of time knocking on doors and talking to people in the corners and moving through these neighborhoods who don't feel the city government has to be responsive to their needs, who don't feel a relationship or connection to the leadership in the city, who don't trust the police uh, and don't feel valued and don't feel that their humanity is recognized and that's thoroughly entrenched in a lot of these communities that fly under the radar. It's thoroughly entrenched in, in the community, what we call that subculture, because we could talk about the mainstream. There's a whole culture in this city that exists below the mainstream. They're not necessarily on social media. They don't cash checks. You know, there's an economy and there's a culture that exists. And I think sometimes we overlook that. Um, I want to say that in, until we can really, really make people feel included in this city and feel humanized by the leadership in this city, that we will continue to have these kind of spikes in, in, in violence. We can introduce programs from, from 2013 to about 2017. I worked in a program called Focus Deterrence, which got a lot of accolades publicly. Um, in our first year, there was a uh, more than 50% reduction in gun violence in, in particularly in South Philadelphia. And every newspaper and every TV show did a story about it, and it was great. So you think that that would be the kind of program that there was an increase in support. But unfortunately, the support decreased. So it went from $150,000 investment from the city down to $120,000. Um, we met monthly with the police uh, uh, department. I don't know if Commissioner Ross is still here. We met monthly with the um, uh, DA's office, the mayor's office, all these kind of public entities. But the one thing in my almost five years in that capacity that we did not meet with was the Commerce Department, the business uh, community. And though the record will show that every month I came to those meetings saying, here's what we need, which was involvement in the unions, involvement by the Commerce Department, involvement from the business community, those cries fell on deaf ears. So even though we promised these young men jobs and opportunity, and I'm not one to say a job is the end all be all to end the violence. I recognize that there are people who have worked uh, at pretty decent jobs and still committed homicides and still committed violence. So I'm not suggesting that um, a job is the panacea to end violence, but what I am saying is when individuals have an opportunity to earn a living, a decent living, and, and make money provide for their families, the mindset change. You take an eight hour shift and an hour for travel, an hour back, that's 10 hours of a day that's gone. So you sleep for eight, you know, that's 18 hours. So you got a, a, a small window and you usually don't fill that window with nonsense when you gotta get up and go to work in the morning or when the baby need pampers or when your, your girlfriend or fiance or wife is saying, you know, let's go to the zoo on Saturday. So it, it, it shifts the, the culture for that person that's living beneath that that mainstream world that we exist in, we pull them in. I still have, I haven't, I, I, I resigned from that job a year and a half ago, going on two years ago. And I still have young men call, come, calling to me and calling me 
you know, Mr. Rubin, you know, uh, uh, I need a job, I, I lost my job, or whatever. And it wasn't because I was so great, it wasn't because, it was simply because somebody built a relationship with them, right? And I'm not even from South Philly, but the people in, in South Philly who created that entree to build these relationships, it flourished. And some of those young people are not still on that subculture vibe. They are, you know, doing well and thriving. And that's the investment that we have to make. It has to be individual, and we have to stop looking at quick fixes. It's not going to be a quick fix. You know, it's going to take a long time, a long-term investment over a period of years. It's going to cross the boundaries of different administrations. But if we can't really envision that, instead of using violence as a political ploy to gain points with the public or to gain votes, then we're doing a disservice to those communities that are suffering. Um, I grew up in North Philadelphia, and North Philadelphia used to be a, a hub of industry, both with Botany 500, with Bud, with Tasty Cake. And there were literally thousands of jobs that are gone, that aren't coming back. And those communities, when you add tax abatements, when you add all these other things to those communities that uh, uh, connect to gentrification, we see how the resources have been depleted from those areas. And so we see schools closures, right? We see um, files escalate because people don't feel like their lives matter. They don't feel included in this process. And this is why they don't vote, right? We gotta, we're lucky if we get a 10% turn, voter turnout in this city. So we have to begin to really look at the big picture. And again, when we talk about quick fix solutions, the, the realities of what I want to say is we, because we've been over the last, I came home in 2002, so the last 17 years, we've invested in teaching young people, particularly violence prevention strategies, conflict resolution strategies, because if they aren't learning those things, it's easy for somebody to pick up their phone when they see a fight and yell out world star and capture that fight on the video to go as viral. Meanwhile, you know, we get stuff like students get dying in bathroom fights. We get stuff like 15 kids jumping on one kid, and, 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 and we see the results of that. So if we don't teach young people in particular how to think better and be leaders in their communities and a voice of reason, if nothing else, don't jeopardize yourself. Just be the voice of reason. Yo, John, it ain't worth it, man. Take care. Don't, don't, don't trip. But they, don't, they may not have those skills naturally. It takes tutelage. It takes mentorship from adults who are willing to invest in them to do that. So I said it to say um, I welcome the city's initiative to address some of this violence. Um, yes, we do need jobs for young people, but we need jobs for adults too. Yes, we do, we do need an infusion of resources, mainly capital. And this city has to learn to trust its citizens. Right now, um, Councilwoman Gill mentioned our community reinvestment uh, strategy. We're pushing the city to, uh, and this is a separate conversation, but we're asking the city to no, it invest. Isn't. No, it's the same conversation. Okay, so let's talk about it. We're, we're asking the city um, to reinvest the savings from closing the jail. And the number that was given to us was $15 million. So that $15 million could be infused in resources and supports in those neighborhoods who need it most. And we're not talking about neglecting any part of the city, but there's some parts of the city that need it more than other parts of the city. We can show you video of walking through certain parts of North Philadelphia that's so trash strewn. I was talking to a friend about what it looks like in some areas, and unfortunately, I likened it to a war-torn city in the Mideast. That was an unfair uh, kind of assessment but mentally, that's the only image I could conjure up to get this person to see the devastation that's happened in the city as a result of abandonment. And, I mean, there are places in North Philly that hasn't been uh, uh, redeveloped since the, the, the Martin Luther King rise in 68. So we're talking about over 40 years, going on 50 years that these neighborhoods have been decimated and mayor after mayor has come Elected official after elected official has come, DA after DA has come, and people have made promises that have gone unkept because we are the silent minority that are that often gets neglected and people have felt like they are uncared about. So what I want to suggest is um, and, and, and really put on the table is supporting the community reinvestment, 
to engage these communities that are directly impacted with resources that are fed not through city agencies, but are fed into those community organizations. The, the brother was just talking about they had 30, 40 men, black men, meet for the last five months to come up with strategies to improve their community, right? And that's exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about that we can't rule from the ivory tower anymore. We have to come down and walk amongst the people. Even Jesus Christ himself, a man who could walk on water, who could turn water into wine, who could feed thousands. You know what he did? He washed people's feet. He acted as a servant, right? Because that was his mission. And we got to dismiss this, this whole ivory tower mentality and make sure that the people at the very bottom feel included in this city or will continue to see erupts of violence. We'll continue to see you know, like this discontent. We'll continue to see this apathy that don't even allow people to participate in the voting process, let alone engage in a political process. So I'm going to leave it there because I got so much more to talk about. I know we're short on time, but I do want to talk, just mention that we have to mentor youth. That's at the top of the list. We have to invest in these communities that have been neglected. We have to engage in people not within the ivory tower, but at the ground level. And we got to trust people. I, I, I know it's hard to talk about money and not talk about accountability, but we got to trust these community leaders on the ground who've been engaged in communities out of their own pocket for years. I know people feeding hundreds of people from their kitchen with no grants, with no funding, with no support, whatever, just taking what they got to make it work because their community has a need that they can feel. I know men personally who are mentoring young people out of their own pocket. Everybody at Frontline Dads are volunteers. Ain't nobody getting paid, right? So, but there's hundreds of other organizations across the city that's doing the same work. And, and I just want to really amplify that work because if, if we, I, in fact, I want to invite council. And I know everybody here is, is from the city and, and I'm kind of shooting from the hip. But I want to invite council to just walk through a few of these communities that I'm talking about. Right, outside of your district, people living on less than ten thousand dollars a year, people with four or five children in the home, right? People with no real resource, they making their way out of no way, and the local school got closed, and now the kids got to catch a bus, right? The rec center is in shambles. There's no supermarket within miles, so they only can go to the poppy store, or they're gonna jump on the bus and only bring back what they can carry. Right, this is real. Then we got people returning home from incarceration and the family's taking on an added burden of supporting them while they transition. This is real. Grandma's raising her grandbabies, not because she really wants to, but because she has to, to make sure that baby is okay and he thrive. I see so many older women with these six-year-old grandsons and they walking on the king and they barely can make it and she can't even control him. You know, because he's a wild, I got a nine-year-old, I know how wild and rambunctious he is. And it's like, it's the cycle just repeating itself. So I just want to urge, and, and I appreciate, I want to personally say thank you to you, Councilman Jones, for taking on the fight for community reinvestment with us and leading that char charge, but also putting your heart into this work as a leader, as a committed public servant. And that's the example that we got to set in order to really you know, Moses and Martin Luther King both told their people, we're going to get there. I might not be with you when it happens, but I'm going to make sure I do my part to get us there. And that's the kind of leadership we need because everybody wants the accolades, and everybody wants the award, and everybody wants the accomplishment the same. I did that. It was my this, my legislation. It was my decision. It was my. But the reality is, I went to a, a training, and I forget the sister's name, I apologize. And it blew my mind, she was talking about the, the, the situation the African-American community is in. And she showed us how like, this, this theory of change that she had. And she was like, it takes three generations. And she broke it down, like from slavery. She like broke it down. And it was like, every time we have a collective cultural setback, you gotta press reset. And, and you still talking about three generations from there to kind of erase that damage and that trauma and course correct. And it blew my mind. So even if we started today, picture perfect, it's still going to take us three generations to get there. And that's what I'm saying. Stop putting the band-aids on stuff. That's really, you know, think tank our way into a long-term solution. Well, first of all, thank you both for what you do. Um, sometimes 
you, you, you might think you're out there by yourself, uh, alone on an island, but you're not. Um, what you do matters to the ivory tower folk because we can't do both and do appropriations and do lawmaking. So somebody has to be the boots on the ground. And we appreciate it. I will take you up on your offer. I've done and learned more by going into neighborhoods, getting, uh, getting people's life examples to teach me on what needs to happen from that seat. Um, there was a group as a result of a murder, um, and, and there were no, there were victims and more victims. There were victims and more victims, meaning that both moms who were raising kids in the same neighborhood have to see each other at the corner store are traumatized because now we have beef. Right. My family, your family, all the cousins, and brothers, th there is going to be more confrontation. And they might want to diffuse it, but it's difficult because of the close proximity in which they live. And the level of what you call frustration in everything. It's not just that act, mm -hmm. it is the fact that we can't find employment for these boys, it's the fact that they're giving up hope, it's the fact that it's Wednesday and I gotta figure out what to eat until Monday because mm -hmm. that's when the stamps come and all of that creates that pressure cooker. Yep. That when I saw this boy and he saw me and he disrespected me. That, that, that baffles my mind. You can't disrespect, I'm not gonna let, I'm gonna go that way. Right. Say have a nice day. But they, you know, it's like that pressure cooker pushes them together. So I understand exactly what you mean. In one, in that same case, it was a bunch of, it was maybe one or two people that were of adult age in the whole house. And I don't mean 21 adult, I mean right. teens adult. Mm -hmm. And they were fending for cousins, brothers, people who just flopped in. And it was almost like, <clears throat> in their mind, Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. And if we, everybody outside of this house, that's on y'all, y'all victims. We gotta figure out how to feed ourselves, keep the lights on, and et cetera. That deep poverty that you speak of, 10,000 in a house is gonna put a lot of pressure on people to produce. Well, I don't know what you're gonna do, you better go get some money. Mm -hmm. So what I hope to do is look at your reinvestment aspect of where, with the savings of the creek, what we should do, and I like the idea, support the idea that to reinvest that money where the problems are, right. where the inmates are coming from, to try to close this spigot. So I look forward to working with you. I want to come out and see what you do too. Um, I, I personally, what part of town? We tell my north it is. Bobby, can, can I call Bobby up for a quick second, if, if, yeah. just to break protocol? Because what? yeah, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, uh, right, Council Greenlee. Just before Greenlee. we do, hold a second. Do we have any other panels to testify? So you're the last, come on up. Because I want to talk about, um, we talk about specifically around the Broad Erie uh, area, which is an area we've been doing a lot of work at, right? We've been partnering with Zion, we've, we've held some political. Can you share the mic with? Yeah, absolutely, and public forums with them. Uh, can you Mr. That Muhammad, Mr. Muhammad, can you, can you share the mic with can you, yeah, um, you. But you. we also did, you know, we walked through the neighborhood and there's some very specific, everybody loves uh, Max's cheese steak, right? And we know CLC is on the other corner, and you know, uh, 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 Black and Nobel used to be at the other corner. But we ain't seeing a hurt, neglect. Um, I know you talked about the human trafficking. Like, there's a lot of sex work in that area, there's a lot of drug, there's a lot of heartache in that area. I just wanna give Bobby a moment to, to really- Can you um, say your, some your name for the record? Bobby Harris from Just Leadership Close the Creek Campaign. I met you, yes. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, you want me to share about that area? Absolutely, that particular area? absolutely. Uh, first, let me uh, say this, which many people don't know for me, I witnessed my mother murdered at the age of seven. 
Uh, at the age of seven, I also tried to commit suicide twice in order to join my mother. My grandmother, who was on the run for the entire part of my life because she wound up murdering my grandfather, who was a domestic case that led her to run from Burncorn, Alabama to Philadelphia as a safe haven. So she didn't understand how to deal with the trauma that she went through, let alone the trauma that I went through as a seven-year-old kid, them moving me from Erie Avenue up to 63rd and Jefferson, where I wound up living with my aunt. And there was no treatment. There was no treatment for me to receive because they didn't understand how to deal or cope with their trauma. It eventually led to me being one of those persons that we refer, we refer to as an orphan. And I wound up learning my life skills in the streets. And those streets activity eventually led to me going to prison at the age of 15 and sentenced for murder and sentenced to a life sentence. I served a total of 29 years and I've only been home for one year and four months today. However, while incarcerated, I took advantage of those opportunities in there, not through the institutional programs, but the human potential programs of bettering myself. And that's what brought about my transformation as a man, particularly a black man, to do something better for myself by writing my own narrative and eventually coming back to the streets and share that because I was sentenced with a life sentence but overturned that due to the juvenile ruling from the United States Supreme Court. However, since coming home, I've been blessed with the mentorship of Reuben Jones, mentoring me in the areas of being a community organizer, but more importantly, I like to say a human potential resource and to use those skills to teach and train our men and women in our communities how to better themselves. Because what we're looking at, we're looking at the face of depression, but more importantly, they speak about the violence. And I must say this, uh, no, no pun, intended to anyone. Yes, there's violence. But the bigger problem, in order to address the violence, we must realize that there's something that's driving that violence, and it's a violation. A lot of our people in our communities are victims of certain things, whether it's the educational system, whether it's the criminal justice system, whether it's the poor or lack of parental guidance. And I mean, there's something that's making them a victim to find themselves in the streets to identify themselves with something that they're not familiar with, but they're adapting negative behavior patterns. So in addressing that, you had asked the question, was it organized? And I sat there and I thought about your question. You know, and yes, it is organized. The violence is organized. The miseducation is organized. You know, the lack of parental guidance is organized. We're looking at institutions in our community, whether they are in North Philly, West Philly, or South Philly, or even inside of City Hall. Everything is organized. Just as we as community organizers and you as elected officials, you must organize, organize but more importantly, collectively with those of us, not just with boots on the ground, but also eating out of our helmets every day to save the quality of life that exist in these communities where people are being killed, where people are afraid to come and stand up as community people and say enough is enough. So I do believe 100% this is a good start, but I believe that start must go a little bit further. And when I say a little bit further, there's an unspoken language in the city of Philadelphia. They fear us. They fear us whether they're black or white. They fear black men standing up. They fear black men taking steps to productively change the narrative in our community by not properly funding programs that are capable of transforming the quality of life in our communities. I know you personally from the conversations I've had with you with Ruben with regards to what we're working on. Not everybody share that desire that you have expressed or share that passion to see that transformation. And that's what I mean when I say that it's organized. Even from here, not everyone is willing to organize collectively. That's in the elected position who's a backpack carrier of every life in the city of Philadelphia and they are responsible for it. So since they're not carrying it, it's an organized I get it. disconnect in existence. And I wish that it can come from the elected people, 
that's in these positions with you, councilmen, as well as us that's in the community with our boots on the ground and eating out of our helmets to save the quality of life. I may use that one. And I'm going to share this with you. You can use that. But also use us, but use us in the proper manner to change the quality of life. When you look in that area avenue where we're hosting these events, we have right now, we're about to start mentoring out of our own pockets. It's, it's a shame for me personally. I see everybody left. I got to say that and I hope it's on the record. Right. Everybody, everybody so left. Did. You know, no pun intended. But that's because a lot of us in the city of Philadelphia, we suffer from amnesia, which is a total and complete loss of memory. We forgot how to live. We forgot how to take care of one another. We forgot how to give back to one another. But more importantly, we forgot how to collaborate and uplift our community as a unit. And this is why you see we come with speaking points, then we depart. We remove ourselves from the problem sometimes. But then there are those that don't remove. And we must reward that with the proper tools. We in the war. War of ignorance? That's the number one thing. Lack of intelligence strips us. And this is what you see down Broad and Airy, my neighborhood where I was birthed at. You know, you see violence. However, you have an institution that came out on faith and welcomed us from close the creek. Y'all can facilitate any programs y'all want in our church. We're conducting judicial candidacy forms. We're conducting uh, uh, councilmen and women forms. We're conducting mentoring programs. We're about to start one right now for the summer, which will be geared towards teaching and training the young men and women in these neighborhoods to get them off the streets how to productively think with a mentoring program we created called Awakening Our Manhood. AMP is the theme of it. That's the acronym for it. However, we're not funded. That's because don't nobody believe in us, but we believe in us. I know you do. Yeah, we, it's people in here that aren't in here that do believe in you. And we're trying to tip the balance to make sure that that reinvestment happens. It, it doesn't matter as much if they're standing here, because half of them watch it on TV, but it's in that stenographer's hand right there. And so, we, we're, and the mayor even watches this. But what I want to say to you is, there's one other aspect I want to add to it, entrepreneurship. Absolutely. If you can't find a job, create one. And I'm, so in another life, I used to write business plans and fund businesses. There are 15 different things that we could get those young people employed by their own hand from everything from exterminating the uh, painting to uh, all kinds of jobs that we should start to figure out where the startup capital can come from. And once they get going, because a lot of the things you learn on the street ain't all bad. 100%, and I want to add this to you. This is where we at. This is what that community hub that we were speaking about with the reinvestment going back into use for our people. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, where's the, when you're speaking about the entrepreneur, it takes a certain language to reach the people today. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, they don't speak the same language. They don't understand when you and I, we may speak, you may say the microphone. We know that's an adjective describing a noun or something. They don't perceive it as that. If you speak the word the to them, they may take that violently. You're too assertive with that. They may react in a certain way. But we sit there and say, for those of us that know how to articulate ourselves and speak a language to the people that they're receptive to, utilize that. Because when you're looking at the youth today, they want money. No matter what, these young children out here, they believe they are entrepreneurs when they're getting into the drug games. No matter what, they may only be moving a thousand dollar or a G pack as it once was called. However, they still see and perceive themselves as the boss of their reality. 
we need to match that, but match it with something productive positive. when you're speaking about the entrepreneur skills. A, a positive G-pack. You understand? A positive G-pack that they don't have to or they're not required to look over their shoulder right. and fear the police arresting them. They don't have to fear someone trying to rob them because they're highlighting that potential that defines him or her as a young man, but more importantly, a productive young entrepreneur. So we have to learn how to teach that to them. Ruben contacted an individual that was going to teach the children IT pro bono and then place them in apprenticeship mm -hmm. and then from a, a paid apprenticeship. But nobody seeks to invest in the ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we really have to attack and address or whatever. And I just want to just add this real fast as closing. You have an example I was explaining to Ruben today. You have Knox Transportation a formerly incarcerated uh, uh, juvenile life for him and his wife. Now, I mean, my brother and sister. You know, they started their own transportation service. And with this transportation vans, service, taking vans. they take them to the prisons. You know, and what they do now, they're taking people to medical trips. So they're incorporating the mentorship program into it for the youth, but also upon completing the mentorship, you immediately go into employment with Knox Transportation and have a job as a driver. That's an entrepreneurial skill from a formerly incarcerated person, but that's an entrepreneurial skill that's being enhanced in our community that needs to be highlighted along with everything else that's productive. And I just want to say really quickly, um, and since the, the room is empty, I appreciate everyone who is here, but speaking to the mic, the, the program that we, you know, submitted to the mayor's office, and I don't want to bash nobody, but I want to be honest, because that's the only way I know how to be. I know that's cost me to, to burn some bridges and lose some political allies, but I'm not going to be fake and phony for anybody, right? I'm not going to kowtow and bend to appease a mayor. He's a man who put on his pants the same way I do. We put together a proposal, right, to, to have the city gift us, if you will, or at least support the project to take over a school that was closed since 2013, Thomas Fisama. We got the auto industry, so an a individual has an auto shop who was willing to teach the young people that business so they could A, get a job uh, with a sustainable living, or B, become a, uh, have to become a certified mechanic, start their own business. We have a tech company. The company is actually out of Baltimore who's willing to, we were going to uh, kind of extend them to, to Philly to teach these skills to, to young people, to give them a sustainable living with jobs that's starting at $50,000, right? These, and I'll be respectful, but his team sat at us in our last meeting about three weeks ago and yeah. told us there was some misunderstanding about that proposal was. We met with him, what, four, three to four times. We've had other conversations with his team. Uh, we emailed in black and white the, the proposal that spelled it out. In our campaign, we always talk about community reinvestment ran by the community, not city agencies. So that was a slap in the face. That was a gut punch. That was a sucker punch if I ever felt one to say, I don't believe in you. I don't want to support this. Because they didn't want to give $15 million, even though that's the number you gave us, that's commitment you made verbally, and I kept telling my team, but that's just a verbal commitment. We gotta give them the, the sign of paper. Cause you didn't trust formerly incarcerated black men to lead a project like that. He don't know that we got OIC at the table. He don't know that we got impact service at the table. He don't know we got all these other industry tech companies and, and, and all those and all these other people at the table. But because he saw a black face with a criminal record, he pivoted on us. He did it about face on us, right? And this is after almost a year or about a year of our campaign of meeting and talking and, and engaging with this, this man about putting those resources from, and we're not talking about resources from the city, we're, talking about a, we're not talking about a new tax. We're talking about the money that you've been putting into a prison to now, you talk about all the time those, I think 11 zip codes, that 80% of our population, 90% 90 of our population comes from in return. So we're, we're pinpointing those specific areas for you to say, here's where our help needs to go. And they looked us in the face and made some other promises that still haven't come <coughs> to fruition, told us to start smaller. Oh, that's too big of a project. We're going to give you a list of city-owned buildings that you can explore. 
Three weeks later, still the damn guy. We're going to give you some parameters in which to pursue. Um, give us some outcome. How many people you going to serve? You know, or, you know, just general specific number. All these things. So that's a good way, right? Because publicly it serves good face to say, well, they wasn't ready. But when I tell you we got, first of all, our organization is, is a $20 million organization. OIC has a long track history since the 60s with the history of uh, Leon Sullivan, multi-million dollar organization. Impact Service is the biggest re-entry transformation program in the city, multi-million. So you're going to tell me all these experts at the table, just like you said, black people was too overqualified to work in city government. You're saying all these people at the table aren't able to pull this project off? So, and, and, so it's a slap in the face. And I just want to say, our pinpointed mission is to take the resources specifically from closing the jail and putting it back in these neglected communities to create affordable housing, to create employment, to, to satisfy public safety needs, to give um, safe recreation. We did surveys. We went in and out these neighborhoods, knocking on doors and talking to people in the corner and had them complete a survey about what was missing in the neighborhood, what they needed in their neighborhoods, what they wanted to see happen from city government, did they feel like the city government was responsive to them, all these things. And this is the information that we're bringing back. We're not, we both are blessed and privileged even to have a job that we can pay our bills for with in comfort and, and, and not, not to worry about and still work within the community. And we know that everybody don't have that privilege and we get that. So we're not asking for money for ourselves to put in our pocket. We ain't one of them tap dancing Negroes is coming shucking and jiving and trying to take money. no back back pocket payoff. And We're here to serve money, the community. Brother. And because the leadership in the city don't believe in that mission, we just ran into uh, a brick wall about three weeks ago. So I didn't mean to vent that, <laughs> but I just want to paint the total picture of our mission for community reinvestment and how we trying to go about pinpointing those resources for the communities that need it most. And that is violent prevention when people are properly employed and properly serviced with the needs. Well, I'm sorry you hit a roadblock in that mission, but for clarification, government is not just the mayor's office, it's city council, it's the courts, and we respect and acknowledge what you do. And, uh, we, and, and, and it's not over. We, the the reason we're having these hearings is to get on the record how people's opinions or how those savings, how that violence plan should look and how it should be implemented. And so, um, you know, honestly, you know, you're an acquired taste, but I have acquired the taste. I, I know you don't dance when there's no music, Absolutely. laugh when it ain't no joke, or scratch when it ain't no itch, and therefore I respect you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I'm a, thank you all for coming out and giving your testimony. Um, this concludes the business of the Joint Committee of Public Safety and Spe Special Committee on Gun Violence uh, Prevention for today. Thank you all very much for your testimony.